I'm uh, Dr. Scuteri. I'm with uh, Sleep Medicine. Uh, Dr. Chernyshev wasn't uh, able to come today. Uh, he's currently in Russia, so he asked me to come in and talk to you. Now, <clears throat> part of the, your ACGME requirements are that you're required to sit through a lecture of, of fatigue, which is fatiguing in itself. So I apologize already for you guys. Obviously, I have no financial conflict or interest in this, and Dr. McCarty, who was here uh, previously, he uh, has a couple things that help out, and we have the SAFER. And SAFER is basically sleep alertness and fatigue education in residency. And unfortunately, we don't follow the military fatigue uh, cycles, and that's actually where you guys come in, and that's what you guys should actually be utilizing as surgeons. Is protocols that are used by the military, specifically with helicopter flying. Um, they usually do 40 hours of uh, consecutive work, and they have 15 flights to accomplish. They have to do this as a task. Uh, there's various types of uh, stimulants that they use for that, and we don't promote that in residency. We'd rather have you fatigued and cut into people with no sleep. So I have no idea why that is. However, there are very valid studies, and the basics of, to, to cut to the, the short end of this, is that every single human needs eight hours and 24 hours. It doesn't matter that um, what time you're trying to do that at, unless you're not on your cycle. So when you sleep, you need eight hours. You have to figure a way to get around that. If you only have a five hours because you're on call, you have to find the other three hours somehow, some way. Okay? And that's the only way to, to combat this. Some people say, I can live on five hours or six hours of sleep. And statistically across the entire world, if you round that up to the nearest whole number, that is 0%. So that's impossible. And so what you're going to accomplish with this is better sleep, more alertness, um, and basically I'm going to go into talks about uh, optimizing caffeine use, which is what the military does. So it's kind of like what I just went over, um, the whole thing about personal lives. And basically, um, the study that was coming out with this, they were basically showing that uh, how did they brainwash people in the 60s and 70s in uh, military applications and things like that? Well, they sleep deprived them, and they fed them terrible food. And then they realized, well, that's just residency. Um, the, despite all this, um, sleepiness and fatigue is grossly underestimated in residency. So to compare yourself, we use the ESS as a form, basically the, your Epworth score of your sleepiness. Uh, residents score 14.7 and narcolepsy score 17. And someone who has obstructive sleep apnea is actually an 11. So you have, you are more tired than someone who has obstructive sleep apnea. Um, it's just basically we don't even test about this. We don't ask questions. On step three, I had one question on my boards for family. I had three. So no one knows anything about sleep. It's a new topic. It's from 1980s. Dr. Chelson, who was here, was one of the first guys who actually came up with what we call the polysomnogram. So we have this misconception that sleep is optional and that is just an absolute myth. Um, so it's really boring to have a new conference, or even right now, after you guys have already rounded and pre-rounded on everything this morning, and you're going to fall asleep literally in my lecture. And the reason why that's going to happen is it has nothing to do with the material I'm bringing up. It's the fact you haven't slept well. That's the bottom line. And so none of those factors cause sleepiness. Um, and so when you get in that situation, you get this thing called excessive daytime sleepiness. And it's all related to your circadian rhythm. Basically, you want to go to bed at 1 AM, and you want to wake up at 10 AM. The reality is you went to bed at 2 AM, and you've got to be there at 4.30 AM. You have insufficient sleep relating to that, or you have a primary sleep disorder already, and, or you just haven't fragmented sleep from paging. So um, it's always, it, it, there's. Every single human out there, it's much, much easier to stay up later 
than to try to fall asleep earlier. That's just our natural circadian rhythm and how this works. So it's easier to adapt to a forward direction of sleep, going from day to evening and nights. And that's why supposed night owls have a much easier time adapting to night shifts. And Dr. Chernyshev, I imagine, wanted to go into amazing detail about sleep S, about these different process C and process S when we sleep. However, it's severely confusing and will make you so lost in the whole realm of it. Um, but the basics is um, we have a certain cycle that is our circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is what tells us to stay up. And for that, you are depositing products, specifically adenosine, uh, from the breakdown of ATP. That is driving your sleep cycle. And as that builds up into a bank, you now have a sleep debt. You need to pay that debt and at the end of the day, and that's what we call getting tired, fatigued, and the reason, the desire to fall asleep. So that is your sleep drive. And there is also another thing with this involved is that physicians themselves <laughs> um, have a lot of these disorders too. And I've seen a ton of this in clinic, um, residents and attendings themselves, someone with severe obstructive sleep apnea where you're like, there's no way this person has obstructive sleep apnea, but they have a mid-facial anomaly or they have micronathia or they have maxillary hypoplasia that's playing into part in this whole thing um, and not their obesity. So there are five domains of what we call clinical sleep medicine. This is with Dr. McCarty, who was the original uh, previous director of sleep medicine. And that is your circadian misalignment, pharmacological factors, medical factors, your psychiatric, psychosocial factors, and then your finally primary sleep diagnosis. Everyone always goes to the primary sleep diagnosis. Doc, I can't sleep, I need Ambien. That's kind of, everyone ignores the other four fingers and that just doesn't work. So um, with the circadian misalignment, again, that's like delayed sleep phase syndrome. That's you want to go to bed at one, you want to go to bed at midnight, and you want to wake up at 10, but you have other factors that are playing into it. Um, insomnia due to drug abuse or to uh, drug substances that we use throughout the day to keep us awake, taking caffeine too late, eating certain foods which have byproducts that lead into keeping you up at night. Medical factors like chronic pain. Chronic pain is, God, I see so much of that and it has nothing to do with their sleep. They're just restless because they have chronic pain. Um, due to mental disorders, anxiety, depression, uh, work stress, family life, all that stuff, all factors into how we sleep. And um, basically then we come back to where I am at, and that's primary sleep diagnosis. So um, sleep apnea. We all heard of this. You guys probably see it when people go hypoxic in the middle of surgeries and things like that when they're obese. Um, sleep apnea is, of course, you guys probably all know, it's a posterior airspace. It gets crowded during sleep. Your tongue rolls back, closes off it when it partially closes, and it sounds, it's a bell, it's a ball and a whistle, and essentially that is your sound of snoring. And <clears throat> with sleep apnea, you get all these other kind of effects. So we know that stroke, AFib, uh, heart disease, congestive heart failure, specifically with central sleep apneas that are induced from heart failure, leading to an exacerbations, multiple hospital admissions for someone who just needs to be on CPAP. Um, so the classic stop bang. Uh, if you have greater than three of these, you have a high risk of having obstructive sleep apnea. Snoring, do you get tired or fatigued during the day? Has anyone observed you from stop breathing? Has your blood pressure been treated ever? BMI greater than 35, are you over the age of 50, is your neck 15.7 inches width or circumference, I mean, and are you a male? These are all the high risk factors. However, this study was, though, goes back to the stop bank, has nothing to do with women, so it is a poor test for women. Women need a completely different test, and we haven't gotten there yet in, in, in sleep medicine. So technical definition is the reversal of behavioral state of perceptual dis uh, engagement and unresponsiveness to the environment. So behavioral mess, closed eyes. So our perception on sleep has dramatically changed. Uh, 
when you go back to even Aristotle to uh, Julius Caesar and, and Brutus, the classic act, that era and William Shakespeare's time, even at that time, it was enjoy the salute uh, of slumber. So, but now we see sleep is a criminal waste of time inherited from our cave days. And this all started during our lovely industrial revolution, Thomas Edison. And if anyone knows who Thomas Edison is, he was a complete douchebag. So he was. His kids hated him and everything. He never slept. And that's, that's exactly what, why I'm actually here is to talk about it's just basically that fatigue and the lack of sleep. Your emotions, your stability goes completely way off. And that's the whole reason why we actually need to sleep. And I feel that the ACGME is making us come in here and talk about this and at the same time telling you guys, oh, you guys got to do a 24-hour call or you have to do 80 hours a week. Now, my perception and all my research and all this stuff is you can do 24-hour calls. You can do 31-hour calls. It has nothing to do with that. Okay? It has to do with the fact that the next couple days after you do a call, you need another two hours of sleep to add into that sleep debt because this is a bank account. You got to keep adding in sleep those following days and you will be fine. There's no reason why astronauts, they have 16 uh, wakes and sleeps because of rotating around on the International Space Station. They do just fine because we have spent all that money into telling them how to sleep and we haven't spent any money on telling us how to sleep. The irony of this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, exactly, right? And the, the crazy irony of that is that um, if you miss uh, 24 hours of sleep, it takes six weeks to recuperate that in terms of it. And you're actually causing reversible brain damage. And I'll go into that whole entire thing. It, it's so crazy in, in what we have found so far. And so you guys should probably all know this lovely gentleman, um, Dr. William Stewart Halstead, um, one of the great founders in surgery. He loved cocaine, absolutely <laughs> loved it, right? And so he um, was well known for it, and this was at the time that he was trying to figure out anesthetics and everything else like that um, to basically uh, <laughs> numb patients and do surgical operations on them. He was fanatic about it, and this is during you know, 1878 or something like that. Well, the combat that they used morphine, and so he was frequently admitted to rehabs and in the rehab centers he was given morphine and uh, believe it or not from this little so-called study on him we found out that that is not the proper approach towards sleep <laughs> because it just simply doesn't work your sleep architecture is completely jacked on cocaine and that is why when you see these MRIs and these images of people who have been chronic and habitual users of cocaine, there is such a gross architectural change in their organic chemistry as well as their organic uh, matter in their brain. So that's not a good way to do it. But um, why do we sleep? All this stuff. Let's go over that. I don't know that. So this is basically what our sleep and wake cycle is, and that's process S and process C. This guy in Sweden in 1980 came up with this idea. So, and it was only last year, in 2017, is it 2018, yeah, 2017, uh, I'm fatigued, uh, that uh, they actually came out with a gene to actually see this mechanism that's happening. Now, we all know that statins, we, for, we all take them at night because that's when those genes are activated, that's when those enzymes are activated. So, just like that, your circadian rhythm on every single plant and every single animal on this entire planet is all revolving around that sun and we all need anywhere between 23, we all have a 23.5 sleep cycle to a 24.5 hour sleep cycle. That is all of us and we have to, it'll, it'll skew off and the, the best example is, is if you're completely blind and you don't have any reception to eye, any light to your eye, you will slowly stagger off every two hours or so and keep going in a direction and it's absolutely it's absolutely horrifying to deal with that and uh, 
So process S is basically, that's your sleep pressure. That's what I was talking about. That is, as long as you are alive, awake, and metabolically active, you're going to get sleepy to the amount of time that you're actually staying up. Okay? And um, this is how we promote our stabilization, our homeostasis inside our body. And um, basically, with that, we, we want to have an opportune opportunity to have a downtime. That is just our nature. And so as process S comes, that pressure comes up. Process C is your circadian rhythm. That is the rhythm that wants to keep you uh, awake. Process S is what's trying to keep you asleep. And they are um, opposing each other, but not in a direct way. One, the, there is a sinal, um, um, the equation of it, it looks like it mathematically there's a sinus uh, rhythm to this, and that is very different than um, your sleep pressure. And so this is a wake and metabolism dependent thing. Um, your daytime act, as you increase your daytime activities, you build up, you are burning off ATP, which endothenosine is released, which causes you to get sleepy. And And so uh, coffee is very similar to it and just blocks that action. It blocks the actual mechanism and that is what uh, promoting you to sleep. So it's directly attacking interleukin-6, interleukin-1, and uh, tumor necrosis uh, alpha. And so and prostaglandins do as well. And the brain thing is way too much into that stuff. You can tell he's a, a lover and fascinated by it. And um, basically, what they have found out is that there is in our brain, we have this network that um, is a lymphatic system. Before, previously, they said there was no lymphatic system inside of our brain. And when we sleep, hopefully it goes into detail about that. Yes, these aquaporin fours, all the stuff. And um, basically, when we sleep, it allows the chemicals that are released are dilating this lymphatic system. This lymphatic system opens up and amyloids are released from our brain and that's the, our garbage essentially of our uh, uh, the brain matter and that is what leads to if you're not sleeping well you get this accumulation of amyloids leading to Alzheimer's. So if you get five hours of sleep for example and you do this repetitively you will develop dementia and I mean in terms of you you won't process your brain will not allow the hippocampus none of that will work it just simply it's very very difficult to be able to process memories and to remember things and so over time you become dumber and dumber and you forget everything that you actually know and you forget how to form new memories with this sleep so that's exactly what I was just talking about um, this was a recent study. And this is, again, talking about that. The beta amyloids are increasing. Uh, so uh, sleep needed versus sleep obtained. This is the very strong difference between the two. And usually, we're on sleep obtained versus sleep needed in residency. And um, again, when you're less than six hours, but uh, the five hours is specifically, there is an actual study that relates to the actual five hours. Um, and we need eight hours of sleep to form at our optimal level. So um, this is attention lapses, basically people uh, not paying attention to what they're doing. And the, um, the scales that are on these things are all different based on the study, but this is a really good one to kind of show you what's totally happening with total sleep deprivation. So you the lapses of time it takes for all of this to occur in this study was in seconds. And if you look, the eight hour one is appropriately at the bottom. And this is a four, at four seconds, okay, is the, the statistic that a car accident, you have a lapse of not paying attention for four seconds. And so of total sleep deprivation, you, you can increase that latency to up to 16 seconds. So, um, the number one thing that you want to do is, if you know you're going to be on call or if you know you're going to switch over to nights, is to not start off with a sleep deficit. That's the number one thing. You cannot go to nights 
and get four hours of sleep, and you're like, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stay up all night, and I'm gonna do this. No, that ain't gonna happen. You can do it, but you're gonna be dumb. It just ain't gonna work. <laughs> it just won't. So you want to start off with a good reserve. It's, it's like I'm saying, it, it's a bank account. You want to store that in there, and then you waste it away versus waiting to use it like a credit card and just keep accumulating debt and hoping you can pay it off. It just won't work that way. So um, what do you guys need? Between seven and nine, and for every single one of us, no one over here is over the age of 65, which is still about eight hours. Kids need more hours of sleep. And um, um, <laughs> Yeah, this happens all the time. I don't need that sleep, and it's not true. You actually, it's genetically made. You can't decide those factors. Um, um, oh, there's a, uh, you can improve some some parts of um, performance, um, but your consistency won't be the same. And so this is, uh, ironically, it is when they did the study, it was no different than an elderly person getting up and going to the washroom. Uh, every single night, and the the funny thing is, this is an on-call sleep, and these are essentially when you're getting paged, the number of times you're getting up, and you're missing all your REM, you're missing all that stuff based on this study. Um, everyone knows all these kind of things. We lose our uh, everything starts. To, your own patients become your enemy because you're the one that stands between you and if they, they stand between you and a few hours of sleep. So what happens when you get less than five hours of sleep at night? Well, you're twice as likely to be involved in a malpractice lawsuit. Um, name one major human disaster, and I will show you that there is sleep fatigue involved. It doesn't matter. Any space shuttle that's blown up was related to sleep fatigue. Every single Navy accident that's happened in the last year, that's because the Navy is now requiring them to do 80 plus hours of work a week and uh, with their sleep, but we do that, but they're driving them huge ships, and that's what's been leading to all their problems on their research so far. So there's all these factors that uh, cause all these problems. You have 1.84 times of in injuring yourself, leading to a serious medical error, are all increased. And of course, I love how serious conflict with nursing staff is not as bad as everything else, so we must be just doing it naturally. <laughs> Um, now, how did it impact their sleep? And so, obviously, when they got less than four hours of sleep, they were really <laughs> stressed out. Their learning was terrible. The impairment to themselves <laughs> was severely diminished. And every day they felt belittled and humiliated by their issues. So, um, surgery, this is an old study, 1998, but in 2016, the orthopedics at, uh, what was it, Gen General Mass, uh, Mass General. They did a study and what they did was they put a tinography uh, watches for two weeks on these ortho surgeons and they watched how they did and what happened. And what's really crazy is that the results are nearly identical to this study. And so there's some people in the surgical world that are actually skewing away from this uh, study that's right here. They're actually saying that it's much worse because if you're doing a simulated laparoscopy, it's not an invasive procedure as much as a trauma or something else that you're trying to really pay attention to in those moments or when if fatigue would be um, strongly causing issues. So there's that study that this is probably even worse than what this is actually reporting. And so they found that there's 20% more errors and it took 14% more time to perform this. Um, and as well as in internal medicine and pediatrics, it took longer to do uh, basic surgeries, I mean, uh, basic uh, small procedures as well as uh, doing EKGs. So, um, as well as documentation in the ER, medicine. Okay, so um, the impact on the uh, medical errors, um, they found that with anesthesiologists, more than 60% uh, reported making fatigue-related errors. Um, and 10% of them were drug errors, and the post-op surgical complication rates due to fatigue was 45% um, higher if a resident was post-call. And so um, with uh, a, the traditional, this is the study that basically uh, annoyed us all with that we have a 16-hour day, and they were comparing the, the rate of attention to failures 
um, between uh, Q23 and uh, less than 16 hour scheduled shifts. Um, and there is a reduce in errors, but I disagree with this study. I'd rather do 24 than 16. Um, the, uh, also, again, this is showing that um, with the traditional every Q3, 24 hours, uh, there's more serious medical errors, diagnostic errors, et cetera. It was statistically relevant. Um, neurosurgery and general surgery, it's, you guys all know this. I mean, there's, it's absolutely um, showing that there is some sleep deprivation involved. So um, they did also another study with meta-analysis of 20 students involving, or 20 studies involving residents, and there is a uh, 24-hour sleep deprivation associated with all this vigilance memory, cognitive performance, clinical performance, all this was more than one and a half of standard deviation of clinical tasks. So this is uh, self-reported errors, and uh, the numbers are uh, staggering. So um, work hours, medical errors, and workplace conflicts by the average daily hours of sleep. And those who had greater than seven hours had a reduction in their reporting of serious medical errors as well. Well, not as much as the reporting of staff conflicts. And uh, another study, this was the New England Journal of Medicine. This even goes way back when, when we knew that was going on, the errors that were related to diagnosing cardiac arrhythmias. And um, impaired speed and errors in performance in laparoscopic surgical simulators, so what we were just talking about, um, there was an increase in unnecessary movements um, and errors, and the time it took was increased. And weight change, uh, medications you use to stay awake, that all increases. It's much less when you uh, have greater than seven hours. And I think increased alcohol use was not statistically relevant. Um, bottom line is you need to be alert and take the best possible care of yourself uh, to be able to take care of your patients. Um, and so with this issue, they found another study, 58% of the emergency medicine residents reported near crashes driving, 80% were uh, post night shift. Um, there's an in with the increased number of night shifts per month, it increased that risk. And uh, also there's a 50% increased risk of bloodborne pathogen exposures due to um, lack of sleep and night call between 10 a.m. and 6, uh, 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So um, after 12, 13, 14 hours, you're, you're stopped learning. There's nothing there. So if you're here past 12 hours, you're done. Like your brain has got nothing in it left to actually remember or do anything impactful on that. Unless you figure a way to figure that out, let me know. Um, uh, with that, of course, when you don't get, when you work longer hours, you get no satisfaction, you're humiliated, and you have no sleep, you don't like work. And so that can lead to a lot of issues. And those who have been here as long as I have have known what those issues are. My best friend here committed suicide because he had 32 hours of no sleep, and he did something in a procedure that did not go as well and uh, felt belittled, couldn't handle it. And he was doing this repeatedly of 32 hours of being up. And this was when in Monroe. And uh, that sleep deprivation, I believe, was probably a big component into what can cause him to commit suicide. So well, he's not the only one. We have three, four residents here who have committed suicide. Sleep deprivation, the high stress environment of what we live in, and the fact that you are in medical school, you've graduated, you've done everything singly perfect and had all this stuff going well for you, then all of a sudden you get to residency and you suck at something. You take that as an impact of personnel and you can't sleep, it leads to an exacerbation of that. And that's why this is so important and why the ACGME is making me do this. So um, there's all these myths. I can get through one call, do all this. Um, you start to decline in your performance 15 to 16 hours after your continued wakeness. Um, after that time, the lowest alertness they found statistically, and that's based on car accidents, is between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m. Essentially, morning rounds is when everyone starts to not lose it. And I'll, I'll show you an example of a program that's in, uh, used by the military that I think in the next couple months they're going to finally re re release to civilians and um, where you can kind of figure that out. So. Um, I can tell how tired I am and all that stuff. Um, P 
people who are sleepy underestimate it and uh, they overestimate their alertness. And the sleepier you are, the less accurate you are to the perception and degree of pyramid, which is why we always try to compare sleep deprivation to alcohol consumption. So um, these residents that were in, in this anesthesiology study, um, they were wrong 76% of the time when they reported having stayed awake. Um, there's unintentional episodes of sleep, and these are called micro-sleeps because you have an excessive amount of sleep depth and essentially you are sleep deprived. And you've seen that. People nodding off, drooping the eyelids, they're not aware, they're spacing out. They're actually, their body is going into the sleep cycle. Their brain waves are actually changing into those rhythms of sleep. And they do it for microseconds. And that leads to other problems with change your alertness and it changes also your perception that you are tired. Um, if you don't recognize that you're sleepy, you're not likely to do anything about it. Exactly what you're just saying. And what, what we are talking about, what your question goes back to, is that your effects of sleep loss are cumulative. You, they keep staggering up. And this is what the military uses, and it's a psychomotor vigilance task. And there's a three different ways of doing a PVT, and that is one is by completely boring and clicking a mouse on a computer. One is actually doing the performance that you do as a task. And then the other one is real life simulation with sleep deprivation. And um, the warning signs of sleepiness, restless, irritable, uh, you keep checking your work repeatedly, you have difficulty focusing, and you just really don't care. And of course, fall on sleep in conferences. Um, this is the sleep epi, uh, epi war sleepiness scale. We use it for um, obstructive sleep apnea. We use it for narcolepsy. It's used for every type of uh, sleep medicine primary diagnosis. And um, these chances you ask yourself in these situations, whether you're sitting, reading, watching TV, sitting inactive in a public place like a theater or a meeting, a passenger in a car that doesn't have a break, and if you lay down to rest in the afternoon, sitting and talking to someone, do you fall asleep? quietly at a lunch without, after lunch with the, without alcohol and driving in the car by yourself and actually falling asleep at a stoplight. These are all the, and we rate it from zero to three, your highest chance of dozing off is a three. Anything greater than 10, we consider to be excessive sleepiness. <laughs> so, it's everything. And then also with the fatigue. Um, with fatigue, it's the same kind of thing and I swear I probably hit sixes on every one of these things. Um, so um, that, that is one thing as well. But the EpiWorth is to me, and that's greater than 36, then you're gonna have it. Um, so these are some management strategies, which is why I think it's the most important thing about this. Um, some sleep is always better than no sleep. And so, but it's at what time and how long you sleep are the most key important thing about napping, and you have to optimize your naps. And see, what happens is, is there's a stipulation with this, and that is that if you are sleep deprived, it, this is skewed because you can go into deep R, you can go into deep sleep in REM really quickly if you're sleep deprived. But if you're not sleep deprived as much, um, taking a, a nap, he wrote no longer than 30 minutes, but statistically, it's 20 minutes. A 20 minute nap. Will, will keep you in stages of one and two of sleep and you'll start to get a little bit of rest. You won't touch into that deep sleep, which is what happens is you get sleep inertia. Once you reach that stage, you love that stage. And you're like, I am so tired. I'm just gonna sleep through this whole entire thing. And that's, so we, we wanna avoid that. So you wanna do less than a 20 minute nap. You can extend it up to 30 minutes, but definitely not longer than 30 and um, Another way to combat this is actually drinking a, a good cup of coffee and then going to sleep for 20 minutes. Because as that coffee is kicking in, you are losing those byproducts that are driving your sleep and you are also blocking it at the same time. So you have a synergistic effect of increasing your alert time after that and it's a way to fast do that. And the studies that do that are in the military and they always use 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is almost like a small cup of Starbucks, I believe. But everyone is different. There's a big stipulation with that too. Some people are caffeine naive, some people are caffeine resistant. So all that has to be user aired and adjusted to you. And if you need to take a nap, 
the longer naps, you have to do it more than two. If you go greater than two hours, that's where you also run into problems. So there's this nice two hour window, two and a half hours, and then less than 20 or 20 minutes to 30 minutes. Um, and that's again what I was talking about with sleep inertia, that it drives you. So um, you know that you have sleep inertia, that you are fatigued, if, and it's a simple test. Take a 20 minute nap, and if you wake up and you're still tired for greater than 10 minutes after that nap, you are sleep deprived and you need to readjust your sleep cycle. And it can take up to two hours for that to completely wear off. So it's like, why did I even take a nap? That was a complete waste of my time because you're now even more tired after two hours. That's the sleep inertia kicking in telling you that you need to sleep. And so there is an advantage of napping. And all of us between 2 and 5 a.m. and 2 and uh, 5 p.m. in the circadian rhythm, those are our windows of opportunity to take a nap. That's when you're most likely to get tired and uh, when you can nap and optimize it completely. So if you're on a 24-hour call, the best times, if you actually have time to take a moment to take a 20-minute nap, you want to do it between 2 and 5 and a.m. and 2 and 5 p.m. Um, that will allow that. But Sometimes on those 24s, if you're only doing 20 minute naps, you are going to have a sleep drive and that's going to affect that. But it takes the edge off, but it doesn't actually replace your sleep. So I'll, I'll tell you that as well. Um, get adequate sleep before your anticipated sleep loss. So if you know you're going to have it, you need seven to nine hours before you actually start that. Okay. And um, the recovery. So an, a true recovery that is related to that on call, you need two consecutive nights of extended sleep to, to restore your baseline alertness. Uh, the brain damage is there for a while. And uh, the recovery sleep generally has a higher percentage of deep sleep and that counteracts that loss of sleep. So your, N, your deep stages, your uh, N3 as well as your um, uh, REM are increased in those days. And so this is another study that was done with sleepiness level post call a normal schedule and uh, equivalent to an anesthesiology residence and extended over four nights uh, normalized their post call sleepiness levels. And <clears throat> getting into bed at the same time, uh, the body likes routine because our circadian rhythm is based on the sun. The sun is routinely going to go down at a certain time every single day, and no matter what, that is going to rise at a certain time of the day in the morning. So you have to think in that mannerism. That's how your brain is. You can't go to bed at 8 one night, 10 the next night, midnight the next. You have to consistently try to keep it that way. So you want the room ice cold. You want to have the AC blaring post call. You want to have all that done. And you want to keep your hands, believe it or not, it's your hands and feet you want to keep warm, the rest of your body cold. Uh, eye shades, darkness, because we want to increase your melatonin that's actually happening. You want to have completely a quiet area and not have interruptions. And <clears throat> you can't go to bed hungry. You need about three hours or two, two hours uh, after you eat is when it's okay to go to sleep. But don't go more than five hours without eating. You'll wake up in the middle of your sleep. And no heavy exercise within three hours of sleep. Um, the uh, I have to go over this, recognize signs of drowsy while uh, driving while drowsy, difficulty focusing, difficulty keeping your eyes on the road, not nodding, yawning repeatedly, drifting into another lane, not remembering driving the last few miles, closing your eyes at stoplights. I imagine all of you have experienced this at least once. <laughs> um, <laughs> the risk factors, again, this is another time after doing 24 hours, um, and the risk factors are in that time. And it's between 9 and 3 p.m. when your post call is another time. This, is, this study showed. Uh, avoiding if you're drowsing, again, the 20 minute nap with coffee before you're going home. Uh, doesn't work. All the classic stuff turning up the radio, opening the window, chewing gum, cold air, water, slapping yourself, um, promising you'll reward yourself. I don't know why he. Um, it takes a four second lapse to increase in dry. And so what drugs do you use? So hypnotics, some people use um, 
Ambien or any of those other types, basically because of the sleep inertia and those benzodiazepine-like drugs only go into stage two in your sleep, you're actually not getting deep sleep with those drugs. They're just knocking you out. So you still have that sleep debt. The sleep debt is deep stages of sleep and REM. So those are four specific situations where you're persistently insomniac and melatonin. There's little data in us, but there's data in astronauts. And so the astronauts have a cycle that it works amazingly and it actually caused a panic attack in me that I was so alert at night, I freaked out. Because um, I wasn't used to that switch in the nights like that. And that is basically, in the morning, you know you're gonna do post, you have nights, you take melatonin two to three hours before you're going to sleep. You make sure you get up at the same time. And also another way, when you're going into a 24, or after a 24 and you're trying to switch the days again, for example. You take melatonin in the morning, two hours before you suspect that you're going to go to sleep. It is a hypnotic in some fashion, so you can get drowsy. So obviously there is a risk factor. You have to be home and wanting to do that. You stay up till 2 p.m., you take a 20 minute nap, and then at eight o'clock at night, you fall asleep. That's what astronauts do, and they reset their cycle like that because they have 24-hour call on the International Space Station. Um, that allows them to do that. Now, they have pharmaceutical-grade melatonin. Melatonin that we have is crap because it's not FDA-regulated. There's only one that is, and that's Remfresh, because that guy actually is the melatonin that is in Remfresh is the one that we use in all the legitimate studies of sleep with melatonin. So he decided to manufacture that and sell it to the public. Now, what they found is, is that the melatonin over the counter, they did three, 30, uh, uh, 30 uh, drugs, that I mean 30 melatonin bottles, brands. They found at Walmart, CVS, and Walgreens. And what they found is that the majority of them have a ton of serotonin in them. They have 5-HDP. They have uh, precursors to dopamine, which would not work and they have uh, ridiculous amounts of melatonin. It's unregulated, so it's between four and 430% of melatonin was found in those drugs. And in that study, they didn't release any of the names of that because they didn't want to deal with the litigation from that. But it was legitimized and it was published and approved by a committee, so that means that everything was uh, standardized in a form and fashion. So I only use Remfresh because that's pharmaceutical grade and it's timed release, which is another a gamut altogether. Um, so caffeine, its effects are 15 to 30 minutes, and the most important thing is a half-life of three to seven hours. It is only relieving a little bit of sleepiness, and it's temporary. However, if you don't take it the right way, you will destroy your sleep architecture, and you won't actually get into a good sleep. And so, for example, this is the uh, military application that's been in existence for a while. It is called To Be Alert is the, this app that they're actually coming out with. And this is my sleep cycle when uh, I had my newborn. So this is, I did it for seven days. And in this app, um, you can pick your type of caffeine uh, that you're using over here. And then it basically tells you when to take your caffeine dose on your sleep cycle so that you're more alert and you'll be at a comparative level of someone who had eight hours of sleep. So on this, you can see day one, I got three hours of sleep, five hours, four hours, five hours, six hours. This is my whole sleep cycle. And so they, what they did, and this is comparing it to your alcohol levels. And so this is a 0.06 blood alcohol level. And by day five, I'm completely shit-faced when I didn't sleep, right? I mean, I have an alcohol content level. It would be equivalency on day five of sleep deprivation is uh, around 0.07 or 0.08 almost. So, uh, and this was at 3.45 in the morning when I woke up to actually take care of my little one. So it, it, the, the problem is, is that you're getting to a level of being drunk when you're sleep deprived and you're trying to do things at the same time. And so you can see that on this other one that is a red scale. This was last week. And last week, around 9 o'clock in the morning, I would have the alcohol, con I mean, my, my reception and alertness based on milliseconds to responding to this program that the military uses. I would be a coolant to someone who has 0.06 alcohol content. And that's in the middle of the week. 
And so that, it, it just shows you that um, you can get deprived from this. And what, what this does is, and I'll go back to, let's see, this stuff, where's this one? No, it's on this. So this is my caffeine schedule down here. So on that schedule that was crappy when my newborn was born, I needed to have 200 milligrams of caffeine at 8 o'clock, and at 1 o'clock have 100 milligrams. Now this is, um, oh, with this app, what they're trying to do is reduce the amount of caffeine that they're recommending in this study, because with the military, um, for example, anyone in the Army who has less than eight hours of sleep and is required during active duty or they're doing something they're required to take, um, at, and they had to wake up at 6 a.m., they have less than eight hours of sleep, they need 200 milligrams at 7 a.m., 200 milligrams at 9 a.m., um, and what they found is that they perform just as well in their actual physical task, their actual job in the military, in active duty, in those situations, they perform just as well as someone who had eight hours of sleep. And so that's where this all goes to. And then adapting to your night shifts, we went over it, and it takes at least a, a week for that to all happen, which is why I always recommend if you have to take two weeks of nights in, in a month for whatever rotation you're on, actually do them consecutively because the next week that you're on nights you will have less errors you'll learn more you'll have more of an environment where you're actually educating yourself um, and that allows you to adjust for all that stuff and um, the direction of course is like we said before your shift rotation going forward in time is easier that's why it's always easier to fly from the east than it is to fly from the west and with jet lag specifically um, and if you can't get any sleep at all and you're on night float and you're trying to adjust to it, some, some residents don't. I see them in clinic all the time for this stuff. You just have to remember you have to get eight hours of sleep. So if you can get four hours of sleep and split it in two periods, that's much better than five hours, believe it or not. And this is what narcolepsies do. We, we give them GHB. We give them that to make them, and we give it at 9 p.m., and we give it at 2 p.m. at 2 a.m. They wake up. They have the most beautiful sleep. If I were to do that to you guys, you would be absolutely devastated every single night that you had to wake up at 2 a.m. and then go back to sleep. But their sleep architecture, because we're con we're uh, consolidating it at that time, that allows them to sleep. And that's what you need to do is consolidate it in these two four-hour blocks. And the number one other thing is about avoiding this light, and that's where we have a major problem with this. Again, we talked about this, uh, not allowing 20, 30 minute naps, et cetera, and all this. And this is, I just wanted to show you guys this real quick before you all fall asleep. This is the difference between the real red and night brightness or night shift by Apple. Everyone can see the green in there unless you're colorblind, and I can see that blue. It takes one photon, one photon, the smallest level of measuring light, a blue light to hit your eye you will reset your circadian rhythm to daylight. Blue light is what screws us up. So um, I take care of the Air Force Base guys, uh, a guy who flies planes right over our head. The guy, this is the only one that is allowed in the military, is this left side. This is done under excess, uh, the handicap function or something. There's a color filter. If you all want to know, I can show you how to do it. And basically, there is no red, there is no blue light coming in through this. When we try to go to sleep, the first thing we do is we turn on a light to brush our teeth. That bright light comes and hits you, it resets your clock again. So you have to dim the lights when you're doing this stuff. The second thing is everyone's on their phone right before they go to bed. Well, that blue light's hitting your eye, you're resetting your cycle, and it, you will not go into a deeper stage of sleep faster. And that's what you're trying to do because you don't have enough time to sleep because you're residents. So you need to maximize that by eliminating any blue light you have. And uh, it just helps tremendously. You will notice a difference. And this is why uh, pilots who are in the military, they have to wear goggles that are red the entire day and the entire night. They cannot use anything else because they're having night vision. They cannot get that blue light. And that's what this, I think, is in the 90s or 80s when they came out with that study. So, summary. So you all have, patients have a right to expect a healthy, alert, responsible, and respo uh, responsible and responsive physician. And that is it. Any questions? Yep. Yeah, compared to deep sleep, sleep, no 
Percentage of it, so we try to so stay. If you get an app that's just aria, is that restorative? That's a good question. So, what, if you're you don't want to go into REM and you don't want to go into deep sleep in those naps because you have to cycle through each stage of sleep to be considered normal, healthy sleep. If you're only staying in REM or deep sleep, you either took a bullet to the head or you have severe brain damage, right? And that's when you're gonna see all them delta waves. You're, 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 you're toast. So you, you can't have 100% deep sleep. You gotta have it staggering through it because you can only handle so much of it. But usually, yes, when those two deep sleep cycles, REM and stage three, that's when all the accumulated toxic products that we have are being uh, released and you know disposed of in our body. So that helps. But the recommendation I have is uh, to look up that 2B alert app, try to figure that out so you can see uh, when you need to take caffeine to keep you alert, uh, not just haphazardly taking caffeine. And the second thing is always remember you need eight hours of sleep every 24 hours. You've got to figure a way to do it. If you've got to take 15 naps to figure that out, you have to do it in some fashion, okay? And you will do so much better and have less medical errors, less complications, and less M&Ms. That's the bottom line. That's what it is. All right? All right, thank you.